The Romans left England 410 years after Christ, and no datable document of architecture exists, again until the 7th century, when we discover the ruins of an early monastic establishment founded by Augustine, an Italian churchman. He was prior of the Benedictine monastery of St Andrew at Rome in the year 596, when Pope Gregory I sent him, along with 40 other monks, to convert the Anglo-Saxon population of Britain to Christianity. On his arrival, he found that pockets of Christianity had been established for centuries. However, he had his first conversion with the King of Kent, Ethelbert, whose wife Bertha was already a Christian. Ethelbert gave him support and a residence in the village of Canterbury, where he and his fellow monks devoted themselves to monastic exercises and spreading the word of Christ. Augustine's record is the baptism of over 1,000 persons in one day, and that took place in the River Swale on the 25th of December, 597. The Pope at Rome was so pleased with him, he sent him a pallium, a type of stole that he conferred as a mark of distinction. Augustine was elected first Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 598. Today he is considered the Apostle to the English and a founder of the English Church. Establishing the Royal Connection also meant that he was very helpful to his successors. Dunstan, in the year 940, founded a Benedictine community at Glastonbury in Somerset and he became its abbot. There are many legends associated with Clastonbury, chief among them those surrounding King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. They have rather overshadowed the legends about Joseph of Arimathea, the man who reputedly donated his prepared tomb for the burial of Jesus after his crucifixion. Joseph of Arimathea was reputed to have come to Glastonbury for a visit and either brought the boy Jesus or the Holy Grail to England for safety after the crucifixion. Legend has it that he marked his visit by driving his walking staff into the ground. It sprouted and became the Holy Thorn, whose blossoms are like a rose. Unlike other roses, this one blooms in winter and a sprig of blooms have been sent to the reigning monarch on Christmas Day for centuries. That is, until the zealot Oliver Cromwell destroyed the original in the 17th century. Fortunately, the locals have propagated them for centuries too, and they planted a new one at Glastonbury, which was again destroyed in a storm in 1992. However, trees around the town carry forward the Glastonbury legend, and the blossom sent to Queen Elizabeth II on Christmas Day now comes from one of these. Dunstan became Bishop of London in the late 10th century, founding Westminster Abbey, which attracted royal patronage. Eventually it transcended all other monastic houses in England, both in function and importance. Dunstan's biographer stated that he was skilled in making a picture and forming letters, as were other clergy of his age, who had reached senior status. At Westminster, the Saxon and Danish kings, Edgar, Ethelred and Canute, all gave relics, while Canute established a residence there that would soon become the Palace of Westminster. In 1002, Ethelred married Emma, the sister of Richard II, Duke of Normandy, and their son, Edward, called the Confessor, was crowned King of England at Westminster in 1044. Edward had been brought up in Normandy, and although he was a Saxon king, the chief influences on his life were Norman. Edward, the Confessor, is referred to by characters in Shakespeare's play, The Tragedy of Macbeth, as the saintly King of England because of all his good works. When he was crowned, he took a decision that ensured London became England's capital. At Westminster, he rebuilt the Abbey on a grand scale, as well as an adjacent palace, and it is there that he established his court. When he died in 1066 without an heir, a conflict came about because three men claimed the throne of England. 
one of whom was his cousin once removed, William, Duke of Normandy. Anglo-Saxon England perished with the death of the man who claimed the succession, Harold II, at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, when Duke William of Normandy invaded England and killed him. William the Conqueror was crowned William I of England at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066, and Harold would go down in history as the last English-speaking king for three generations, as French became the smart language, Latin the professional language, and English the popular speech of the ordinary people. Following the conquest, William granted his most loyal of subjects land on strategic sites in England for their continued support and allegiance. Fortified dwellings, initially built of wood, were replaced with stone, and within a generation of the Normans coming, there were no fewer than 500 stone-built castles in England. Chief among these was the White Tower, a building that by the standards of its day was massive, 90 feet high from ground level to battlements, and it still dominates the later buildings surrounding it. William the Conqueror is indeed significant, primarily because he implemented two laws that would establish the relationship between a house and its land in the English consciousness, and ultimately affect their unique development. He declared that all the land in England from that day forward belonged to the king, and could not be owned by an individual. The individual only gained rights to the land if he accumulated enough rights and then it was considered freehold ownership. He also instituted the law of primogeniture, which meant that the firstborn son automatically inherited his father's title and property. Both of these laws established that land ownership was the only sure basis of power into the future. It was nothing to do with farming. The point of land ownership was that tenants and rents came with it. A landowner could call on his tenants to fight for him in hard times, to pay rents or to vote for him in later centuries, and jobs and perquisites by the government or perks were the reward in return for his support. The more the landowner prospered, the more anxious fellow landowners were to be connected with him. Arranged marriages ensured descendants would acquire the leverage for more jobs and perks, the ideal route to power. Money could be gained through trade, commerce or by fighting and providing services to the government, the king or the queen. However, money, unsupported by power, was likely to be plundered and from the Middle Ages until the late 19th century in England, Anyone who wished to have it all invested in land and a house set on a country estate. From late in the 12th century, Gothic architecture predominated. Learning and literacy at first were not considered necessary requirements even for a great lord. The protocol attached to the offering of hospitality was formed in the Great Hall. It was used for receiving, dining with and saying goodbye to guests, as well as Christmas junketing and entertainments, and arms and armour were kept at a ready in case of attack. The Great Hall had a central hearth, from which smoke escaped through pottery louvered vents in the roof, that operated much like a modern Venetian blind, with horizontal movable slats controlled by cords. A Norman keep at first, wind eyes, or windows as we call them, in the form of vertical slits were inserted to be used for shooting arrows at the enemy. However, in between times their shape attracted the most horrendous of drafts. They eventually became larger openings allowing more light into the building and translucent animal horn or woven matting was used as protection from the weather. Glass was still a luxury item for a very long time and very scarce, but eventually as periods of peace became longer and techniques of building and manufacture improved, 
it would become more readily available, albeit in small pieces at first. Floors, initially of rammed earth or chalk, sealed with sour milk, were later made of stone and strewn with rushes and herbs. The stone floor at Penshurst Palace is laid out in a pattern with an octagonal pattern around the central half. The roof rafters were made of chestnut rather than oak. Dining tables were simple boards on trestles. And at Penshurst, the arms and armour, trestle tables and benches are the only surviving examples of their kind left. During the mid-13th century, a major advancement in building technique was made possible by the introduction of the mortise and tenon joint, held together by wooden pegs. This meant that a timber structure could be assembled and raised more easily using unseasoned oak, the joint allowing for it to move and change shape as it dried out, and great ceilings became masterpieces of the carpenter's art. Eventually, tiles in three colours were used on the floor. The look of tiling achieved by the use of a stamp in wet clay. It depressed a rectangle filled with clay of another colour. These later evolved into inlaid tiles about the second quarter of the 13th century, of which the most popular colours were red with white, and by the 14th century, tiling was widespread. During the ceremony of eating, the protagonists sat around the main table, being served from the other side as in classical times. An open cupboard displayed wealth in the form of silver or gold plate, which was far more valuable than the coinage of the realm. A cloth was drawn over the tables, spoons, cups or tankards were laid out and food was eaten with fingers from a wooden trencher or from a thick slice of bread, which doubled as a plate. A canopy was placed over the main occupants, not only to signify their rank, but also to protect them from the dropping of birds who constantly gained access through the opening in the ceiling over the open hearth. The company, dining in style, was protected from drafts by a panel screen sighted at one end of the hall. There were three arches. One led to the pantry from which the yeoman of the pantry dealt out the bread one to the buttery where the yeoman of the buttery dealt out the beer and candles and the middle arch which was often bigger than the other two led to the kitchen it was from the kitchen that a procession carrying the food passed into the great hall and it provided an impressive ceremony the main dinner hour during this period was before noon and supper was about four o'clock two meals a day was considered sufficient for a rest man Though a labourer may eat three times a day, as he that eat often liveth a beastly life. Three meals a day was not common before the 16th century, and at this period it definitely defined your place in the hierarchy. Haddon Hall is an impressive building that dates from 1370, and it has often been used for period movies. Its style of panel construction was known in classical times and reintroduced into furniture design in England at this time. This had a considerable effect on the construction of wainscoting or panelling which lined the walls of houses for insulation purposes. At Haddon Hall there is a brickwork patterned stone floor with oak wainscoting or panelling around a side hearth. The roof at Haddon was reconstructed in 1923 using 40 tonnes of oak. A lead box was buried in one of the beams preserving details of its restoration. A deep window embrasure provided seating and seclusion from the main body of the hall and cushions transformed the hard stone into a comfortable seat in a trice. It was at this time that cushions usually made from my lady's old worn dresses, became a symbol of luxury and ease, and they were very much associated with status and dignity. The embrasure had the advantage of good light and could be warmed with a portable brazier, much like they had in Roman times. 
It gradually evolved into an oriel window, the embrasure, and it projected from an upper storey. Later, it came down to the ground floor and became a bay window. The side wall chimney was invented late in the 11th century, but was not common until the 14th century. This improvement meant that fires could not only give out heat, but suck up the smoke in quite small rooms, which in turn meant privacy now became possible. Great tapestries imported from France, the Low Countries, which are Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, with the most famous of these coming from Arras in France. They were woven to fit a room and could also cover the door to keep out drafts. Attached to a wall by rings, they provided an alternative to wall painting, which was also popular. By the 14th century, castles from being fortified centres of administration and supply bases were also evolving into noble dwellings. A great gatehouse had rectangular towers, an innovation from earlier castles and valuable for guarding the entrance. It had murder holes, openings that allowed you to pour boiling or caustic materials onto unwelcome guests. At this point in the Hundred Years' War between England and France, the French had gained complete control of the Channel, ports and surrounding countryside, which was constantly threatened by raids. The household's four main functions were administration, power, state and hospitality. Power was a physical force. A full-time army enabled the Lord to maintain his standing with the King, assist him when needed or apply pressure in times of trouble. As privacy became possible, the family could greet official guests in the Great Hall or receive more intimate guests in their own private chamber. Painters were becoming skilled enough to attempt imitation marbling of surfaces and red lead or red and yellow ochre was added to a simple whitewash formula. Yellow ochre was also sometimes mixed with varnish and this became a favourite finish on the oak timbers of great halls all over England. Ceilings made of plaster were introduced and decoration was added in the form of applied mouldings. The ceiling was divided into small squares and a new addition too was a richly carved and coloured cornice that covered the joint between the wall and the ceiling to disguise any movement or cracking. The county of Durham had been one of the last parts of England to fall before William the Conqueror and the magnitude of his achievement seems to reflect itself in the heroic scale of the cathedral at Durham. Begun in 1093 by French Bishop William of St. Calais, Durham was one of the last before the arrival of the Gothic and it is still considered one of the glories of the Romanesque style. Its massive circular piers are deeply cut with abstract patterns of zigzag and lozenge form and it produced an overpowering effect that certainly provided a powerful backdrop for Kate Blanchett as Elizabeth. The Gothic style had first reached England by means of the Cistercian Order and the Norman Conquest, and more than half the cathedrals in England were the abbey churches of their monasteries. Gothic engineering feats seen at their grandness in the building of great cathedrals in England were the realisation of a magnificent ideal. They were the product of a team of highly skilled craftsmen and creative minds working together. This is a good place to make a pause to reflect on a few particulars about Christianity and its sacred spaces. For a Christian, the church is not just a building. It's a collective term applied to the body of people who were and are followers of a way of life espoused by Jesus, a young man the Romans had crucified. At a point in their history, they needed to secure their own sacred space to worship together rather than an ancient Roman building. This meant a purpose-built space that could be consecrated as holy ground. A cathedral is a church building with a difference. It contains the seat of the bishop, the seat of authority. 
The seat of the bishop still exists and is called a cathedra, which comes from the Greek word for chair. It also gives the building its name. If you take the cathedra out of a cathedral, it goes back to being just a church. The chair of St. Augustine is one of the most ancient extant cathedras still in use. Made of Purbeck marble, scholars argue about its dating, but the Diocese of Canterbury says it dates from somewhere between the 6th and 12th centuries and was originally part of the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket. It has always been used as part of the ceremony to install the current Archbishop of Canterbury. During the Middle Ages in Europe and England, a town could not be considered a city unless it contained a cathedral. It was the central pivot around which the whole community functioned and it was the aim of the church to reflect the glory and mystery of God, an expression on earth of the heavenly banquet. The bishop was in charge of the cathedral through his clergy and the nave and side aisles were reserved for the people, the knavery or common people. This distinction is important to our understanding of what affected their design. People ate and slept in the nave, talked without whispering. They could bring in their dogs and since there were no pews it was easy to move around. Often the nave was also the village marketplace in inclement weather. Matters not concerning religion were discussed there, meetings were held, markets took place inside with hawkers selling their wares and that is why there are so many trades represented in stained glass windows. A workman at this time laboured four days a week because of the great number of feast days. These were brilliantly organised and very splendid. The amount of spare time in the Middle Ages more than likely had a considerable influence on the Cathedral Crusade and enlargement of churches. A cathedral needed to be large enough to hold the people who came from every corner of the town and there was hardly an empty space. There has been a church building at Lincoln in England since 1092. However, it wasn't until after the Norman invasion in 1072 that it became a cathedral. In the library is one of the only extant copies of the Great Charter of Freedoms, the Magna Carta Liberatitum, a significant document that led to the establishment of constitutional law. As well, it has a school book from 1410 containing the first recorded rhyme about Robin Hood. Like many other cathedrals, its space has been added to over the centuries and angels are a prominent feature. In the year 1280, the bones of its former Archbishop Hugh, who was canonised as a saint in 1220, were interred inside the cathedral. St Hugh's primary emblem was a white swan, which was his constant companion at Lincoln, even guarding him while he slept. The development of the Gothic style in England has been divided by historians into three phases. Early English, the decorated style and the perpendicular style. Each have their own defining characteristics. The early style used the pointed arch, which allowed a whole range of new building expression to take place. Arches could span greater distances, allowing vaults to be taller and wider and to support greater weight. This in turn encouraged the use of stained glass. On the exterior, an innovative device called a flying buttress distributed the weight and thrust of the roofs and walls right down to the ground. Wells Cathedral is a great example of the early Gothic style, built between 1175 and 1239. Its west facade is embellished with niches containing almost 300 of its original 500 medieval statues. The west facade, built between 1209 and 1250, is 100 foot high and 150 feet wide, exactly twice the width of the nave. Wells still has many of its associated buildings intact, including the octagonal chapter house, approached by steps worn down by generations of feet. Seats around the wall provide seating originally for more than 40 members of the clergy. The decorated style has a greater stress on horizontals with straight east walls and the OG, a double or S curve, which occurs chiefly in arches and in the stone tracery around windows. It takes its inspiration from exotic architecture encountered by English crusaders. 
No other country has produced anything as novel, resourceful or lavish as the English decorated style, as demonstrated by the glorious Lady Chapel of Henry VII in Westminster Abbey. The final phase of the English Gothic style is called Perpendicular, which once established continued without major changes for 250 years, affecting both ecclesiastical and secular design. It was characterised by an emphasis on straight verticals and horizontals, by slender vertically subdivided supports and large windows, and one of its major triumphs is King's College Chapel at Cambridge. The vault has been described where stone is robbed of its weight and density and suspended aloft as if by magic and the fretted roof achieved with the wonderful minuteness and airy security of a cobweb takes one's breath away, the detail alerting us to the intricacy of its design and the great skill of the craftsman who rendered it. A cathedral has a spiritual purpose. It is an outrageous statement of faith. It declares a belief in a certain conception of man's relationship to his maker and in a society which acknowledges this relationship to be the central fact of its existence. The design and fabric of a cathedral as it slowly evolved was the product of all these factors. You should not dwell in tombs made by the dead for the living. And though of magnificence and splendour, your house shall not hold your secret, nor shelter your longing. For that which is boundless in you abides in the mansion of the sky, whose door is the morning mist, and whose windows are the songs and silences of the night. For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind, and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing, but to free the breath from its restless tides, that it might rise and expand, and seek God unencumbered? The Cathedral Church of Christ at Canterbury is the cradle of English Christianity. It was from Canterbury in the days of Augustine, its first Archbishop, that England was converted to Christ, and for 350 years it was to be one of Christendom's chief places of pilgrimage, surpassed perhaps only by Jerusalem and Rome. Today its Archbishop has many national and international responsibilities, but he is first and foremost a Bishop in the Diocese of Canterbury, the first among his equals. While the sacred space itself has seen many changes, not only in its own fabric, but in the people who worship there, it is still and always has been about the stories of the people who surround it, build it, pray in it, grieve in it, get married in it, are happy in it, seek joy and forgiveness in it, that touch all the human levels of emotion. Love, loyalty, tragedy, sadness, happiness, intrigue, action and passion, they're all here. It is importantly too all about faith and how it can move mountains. Early Christian artists when translating into visual form the imagery of the Bible and its stories had used metaphors such as the grapevine, as grapes and winemaking had become symbolic of Christ's sacrifice and of the Eucharist or Mass, a service of remembrance. They were also symbols associated with the former pagan god of wine, Dionysus or Bacchus, who like Jesus had died, been buried and risen again. Giving Jesus a likeness was exceedingly difficult. He had been Jewish and the Jewish faith did not approve of likenesses and it took a long time for it to become acceptable to portray him with a visual image at all. By combining the likeness of Jesus the Christ with words, signs and symbols of art, the church eventually succeeded in depicting two of the hardest things to represent. His dual nature, fully human and fully divine. Christ as light of the world, with a golden halo or clothed in the radiance and glitter of gold mosaic. 
He was the god of light, dispelling darkness, much like the pagan god Zeus, whose great cult statue had stood at Byzantium until destroyed by fire in 475. Eventually, it was the cross, the instrument of his crucifixion that represented his triumph over death and unconditional love. If human culture is understood as a corporate undertaking in which all people succeed in establishing a distinctive style of living based on common values, it can be seen that much of what is distinctive about the Christian faith emerges from its dialogue with it. This dialogue is inherent in the relationship that takes place not only between Christians and those who do not share their faith, but also among Christians themselves. <laughs>